All right, so if there aren't any questions about that, let's talk about 25 to approximately 45 in the uh, secular age, okay? Because the reason I had you go back and look at this is because now we're at a point in our other readings where we really need to remember that the way that Charles Taylor describes in, in the enchanted mindset is roughly the way these authors are thinking. And I think if we really thoroughly get that, then we'll see what they're writing in a different light. It'll, it'll be more meaningful. Um, so I just wanted to cover some of the points that he makes in, in this writing, because it's a lot about the enchanted mindset and then a little bit about the contrast and how hard it is for the modern mind to, to thank you, uh, to be able to grasp that. You just want to pass that take one. This is just something for you guys to keep over time and to think about as you read and as we talk. Uh, some, of the, some of the ideas that we now consider modern, you see their origins in medieval thinking. And so that's just something for you to keep and maybe make some notes on from time to time. Okay, so Taylor talks about there's three features of the enchanted world or the enchanted mindset. The first is that the natural world that people lived in testified to, the, to divine purpose and action. So let me just ask you what you think that meant, that the natural world that these people lived in testified to the divine purpose and action. How did that work, do you think? Uh -huh. well, I guess it was sort of playing into the fact that uh, it's like he says later on where the enchanted is sort of in everything. Mm -hmm. Therefore, if the divine is you know, present in the uh, general like, way of life, then uh, you get the, the things where it's like, not only are the actions sort of following the sort of divine way, but also the outside world itself is sort of organized in a sense. Mm -hmm. So okay. we have the purpose and not the rhythm to it. So the natural world seems ordered and purposeful, right? Is there some reason why that doesn't occur to modern people as much that would highlight the difference? I mean, when you go, well, you know, when you go out into a park or into your backyard garden or whatever it may be, and it doesn't occur to you necessarily to think of it as in that light, you know, why is it? Why, why was it more the case for these people back then? Yeah. I guess it was sort of um, in a, in a uh, Star Trek sense, you've got the idea beforehand where it's like everything sort of had an essence even in ourselves, and therefore like we were connected to the world quite indefinitely. But when we get this sort of existence procedure, uh, everything is sort of uh, in contrast to ourselves. We have sort of a power to overcome nature, but in the sense of a metaphysical sense, where uh -huh. it's sort of like a we can we can uh, change the we can change the world, and it doesn't really have that much. The power of the world itself has is sort of uh, not knowing to us. It's sort of all really in our head nowadays. Sort of like you were saying later on, uh, that bile. These days we just be like I'm depressed, but I'm depressed because it's my mind. It's not because this physical thing is making me depressed. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So we're really talking about a deeply different way of thinking here. I like that the reference to the black bile, which I had to look up because I'd never really. I'd never heard of that uh, particular uh, concept, but it, in their mind, there was a physical uh, other reason, you know, for for why a person was in a melancholy mood, as they might put it. Um, so yeah, I mean, it, when they when they went out into the natural world, and I guess I would emphasize that that the natural world was also very much more a part of most people's daily lives. That. They, you know, we literally can avoid it quite a bit of the time. You know, we have indoor plumbing, for instance, right? Okay, right there, we don't have to go outside. <laughs> uh, we don't have to go outside very much to get food. We get into a car, we go to a grocery store, which is another building, we go back to our house. They would have at least probably had to go to an outdoor market if they weren't growing it themselves. Uh, many people would hunt, or if they didn't hunt, they would have bought their food from somebody who did. And a lot of more things ha would have happened outside, so there's that. 
And then you, you pointed out a, a very important point, which is that these days, for whatever reason, and I think Charles Taylor is going to try to explain this, we see ourselves as manipulators of nature, of, as sort of um, overlords of nature, you might say. So we look at it as a more maybe like an extension of ourselves as a tool that we can use. Yeah. Could, could you say that sort of uh, uh, arguably has become lesser these days? Would you say in terms of like transcendentalism, where nature has like a, as a, also has a, a power whenever we do go visit, you could say that they hold uh, enchanted worldview is a completely gone? I would say that's right. I mean, there are people who do want to try to remind people of this and bring it back. One person that I that pops into my mind is Terence McKenna, who of course has some issues. Maybe some pe people might say, but but he does does want to try to get back into people's mind this notion that 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 perhaps these things that modern people dismiss are real, that they can be experienced, <coughs> and and that uh, the modern mind is not always open to them. So there's a lot of different groups. I would agree with you who are we're trying to bring that back. It's like, uh, like for, for example. Uh, yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, Actually, and Wendell Berry is an author I've read in the past who in his own way does the same thing. He tries to remind people in his mind, you know, nature is an extension of, of God, human beings are stewards of nature, whereas the modern person tends to think of nature as a, uh, like I said, a tool or you know some some instrument to be used by us. We are the creator. So there's a lot of different ways in which uh, people are beginning to, I guess, rebel against that. Uh, what Taylor calls the body mind dualism, and um, you know there are a lot of different avenues to that. So yeah, that's a good point. So so this point about you know how people would have experienced the natural world is an important one for Taylor. He mentions the more dramatic events that in particular people read a certain way. Um, I just went and gave a talk on Thucydides over, over the weekend or over the first part of the week I should say. And uh, you know back in the day in, in those days in ancient Greece during the Peloponnesian War when an earthquake or a eclipse of the sun happened, it was definitely taken as a sign from the gods and there were rules about what you should do and what you should not do. And so if an eclipse happened, for instance, your army was not supposed to move. It wasn't supposed to move for a certain number of days and there were certain um, rituals that you were supposed to undergo uh, you know, to kind of like placate the gods, right? So that your battle would turn out. Well, Thucydides reports in one instance the Athenians did this when they attacked uh, when they attacked Sicily, uh, when they really should have been retreating because they were being a, they were being trounced. But an eclipse happens and they wait 27-ish days or so, and this was their ruin in this case. So it's not as though everybody, and this is the the point I guess I was trying to make with the Thucydides example that Taylor also makes. It's not like everybody in these days totally bought in to the idea that all these natural things were acts of God or gods or spirits. Some people have always been <coughs> dubious about it, but they were the exception to the rule rather than the rule. Okay? And what Thucydides was trying to do was to say, no, you know, all of you ought to think about the fact that maybe this is a, natu a natural occurrence that isn't related to the gods. Plato sometimes questioned these types of things, you know. So it's it's not like everybody had this way of thinking, but 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 they couldn't also they couldn't completely extract themselves from it, and you see that with Plato as well. He tries to extract himself from it, but he doesn't totally. He falls back into the same way of thinking in a way with his the ideas. Uh, another point Taylor makes is that. God was implicated in the very existence of society, he says. For, for people living in these feudal times that we're going to be studying, God was implicated in the very existence of their society. What, what did he mean by that? What was going on around them in their social life that where they couldn't really escape from God and God's presence in their mind, in their lives, I should say. 
what, what would their experience be? Like that would, you know, like maybe today you might say people go experience God if they go to church or synagogue or something like that, but yeah. It was inherent in everything, basically, whereas like, all the institutions, like parishes and churches, they were quite, uh, they, they sort of uh, helped other like, businesses and influenced them in sort of some sort of way. Everybody was part of the community, which everybody sort of uh, brought the same ideals sort of thing. So in that way, you couldn't really escape it. It was all, it was all built in, like, for example, uh, every, you, you'd be seen as an oddity or a weird person if you didn't go to Sunday church at the end of the mm -hmm. week, and we'd be like, oh, that's a bit weird. So you saw how you were expected, and even then you have, especially in smallest villages, where it's like you, you we have a priest that you see quite often, monks and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it was, you couldn't get through your day, in other words, without having multiple reminders, and of course, um, at certain times of the year, for many religions, you you eat certain things and not others. You know, I mean, to to this day, Catholics have these dietary restrictions during Lent. Muslims can't eat during the day during Ramadan. And so there's all these various ways, festivals, um, you know, uh, acts of piety, spiritual discipline, right? Expectations for your relationships based on religion, like expectations about your marital relationships and your family relationships. and so. Yes, I mean, I, I think that's what he's trying to say, is that it just was so everywhere that a person couldn't, couldn't escape it and didn't really think about escaping. It's just part of life, right? Um, and so very much taken for granted, it would have, like you said, been the odd person who did exist, they did exist, who kind of thought, mm, you know, is all this really real or do I need to? Now, did many people kind of take it with a grain of salt and, and continue to be very worldly? Absolutely. It didn't mean that they didn't also think this stuff was real. But, you know, Taylor acknowledges, yeah, there are a lot of people who are kind of crude in their understanding of these things, maybe treated them very superstitiously or, or sporadically, you know. Um, but when it came right down to it, did not think in terms of, well, it's false or I don't need it, right? Um, and then finally, he talks about uh, the true you know, feature of the enchanted world being a, a, an awareness of the existence of these spiritual entities, good spirits, evil spirits or demons, um, and the force of God in the world, and the idea that because there's evil, and this evil is, is considered real, palpable, you know, kind of ever, there a threat. Uh, this is the reason why people thought we need God. This you know we need God to protect us from the evil forces, right? And and this of course is why the church or whatever religious institution exists in a particular society becomes that much more important because it's where the effort is organized to try to control you know these evil forces and to make sure that good outweighs the evil, right? Not only for the individual, but for the society, because there's this notion that everybody's all together. Remember his discussion of how, you know, people were very intolerant. If somebody gets out of line, if the, if the oddball doesn't stay <coughs> quiet, but starts openly saying, no, I don't believe in witches, or I don't, you know, I don't think evil spirits exist, um, or I think it's just, you know, you're not really possessed, you're just crazy. These people were considered a very real threat to everybody's spiritual safety and, and physical safety because they felt that, you know, that if God abandoned them, bad things would happen to them. They'd be in the power of this other, this darkness, right? Um, so that's by way, and, and I think Taylor almost offers an apology in a way for some of the intolerance of the so-called dark ages, right? Where witches got burned or heretics got burned or persecuted. Um, obviously he wouldn't support such actions, but, but at the same time he's asking us to imagine, if, imagine yourself truly feeling as though 
you and your society are under existential threat because a person is, in effect, capable of drawing in those evil forces which may attack and destroy the harmony and the peace that you've got. Um, there's a couple of examples uh, that I thought were particularly good of him discussing this. Um, one's on page 32, if you have it. Uh, one, two, three, fourth, fourth full paragraph down. He's talking about the cult of the saints in Christian Europe, he says, we can see how the forces here were not all agents, subjectivities, who could decide to confer a favor, but power also resided in things. And this is particularly hard for modern people to understand, I think. The curative action of saints was often linked to centers where their relics resided, either some piece of their body, supposedly, or some object which had been connected with them in life, like in the case of Christ, pieces of the true cross or the sweat cloth which St. Veronica had used to wipe his face and which was on display on certain occasions in Rome. Um, and he goes on to mention sacramentals, uh, the host, candles that have been blessed, and so on. Um, those types of things still exist in our world, too. Far fewer people actually resonate around them, but they do still exist. I think I mentioned before break that somebody came through Manhattan and visited St. Isidore's with a relic of St. Jude. And there was a St. Jude ceremony and people got up and touched the relic of St. Jude. So I don't know what was going on in everybody's minds when they did that. Probably not most of them the same thing that went on back then where a person probably would feel as though by touching that relic, they touch the spiritual energy and power of St. Jude, okay? and that that could have some actual miraculous or curative power in their lives. Okay? Um, it's a magical, we might call a magical way of thinking, right? Um, let's see, on the top of page 33, he says there's a whole gamut of forces ranging from super agents like Satan himself forever plotting to encompass our damnation down to minor demons like spirits of the wood which are almost indistinguishable from the loci they inhabit and ending in magic potions which bring sickness and death. So from <coughs> our perspective um, or I should say from the, from the typical modern point of view how do these things, these beliefs, seem to people now? How would we explain them? If we met somebody today who actually believed that, what would the typical modern Western individual think about that? It would be a bit odd. Um, I, at one point, was on this like, tour group in Belgium, and we stopped by a church. And well, it was just like the normal, like, here's the local university and the town hall, and I'm like, here's the church, and I'm like, yeah, another old building that's like historically interesting. And whenever we went in, it's like, and here's like some really ancient vial of dried blood that's supposed to be Jesus's, and we're like, now we all can like go bow to it. Mm -hmm. And so like some people wind up, and some of us were like, no, we're gonna pass on that, just not, mm -hmm. what, not what we thought we were doing today. Right. So it was interesting to see some people went up like as it was a religious experience, some people went up who just didn't want to be that didn't want to be that person to step back and some of us were like, no, that's not something we feel comfortable with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Curiosity was probably there for some people too, yeah. you know. We just kinda of wanted to check that out. But for people who were uncomfortable with it, what was the if you could the compass, the reason, or try to describe the reason why? Um, some were not Christian. Okay. And then um, the ones who were Christian, I think it was a, it was a bit close to like the golden calf kind of thing, okay. where it's kind of this physical object on earth that people are worshiping like it's an element of God. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so almost like it's a, false idol, it's an object, and objects shouldn't be of 
a focus of reverence. Yeah, right? and yeah. I, I think what was interesting as well was that the people who I know weren't religious were like atheists. I think all went up. The people it was like if you weren't Christian, it was because you were something else that you decided to not go up. Mm-hmm. I think that's a that story captures the modern situation really well because you've got all kinds of reactions to that, right? We have tons of choices, everything from I'm sure there were one or two people in that crowd that actually went to that, you know, fully believing they were venerating Christ, all the way to people who were you know, I'll be polite. Other people around doesn't really, you know, doesn't really affect me, but it's the, the nice thing to do so that not to, like, upset other people all the way to, that's not right. It's wrong, you know. I, I've been taught that the objects are not imbued with these kinds of spiritual powers and that that's idolatry, and I can't do that. Or I'm an atheist, I'm, I'm indifferent, I mean, there's just so many different reactions, and that's the world that we live in now. Yeah. And also, I'm guessing some people also like doubt that that was the blood of Christ. Oh yes, yeah. skepticism. Yeah. Like, is it just being? Is it something that somebody did at one point yeah. in time? Yeah. I don't think that that was something that made him and stuff. Because I was one of the people who didn't go up, and so like we had time to chat about like, hey, aren't you going up? I'm not going up because of this. Um, and I don't think that anyone chose not to go up. Like, that was a consideration that everyone kind of thought about, but I don't think it was the deciding factor for anyone. Hmm, that's interesting. That thought that you just um, expressed occurs to me quite a bit, that because there are so many of these things around the world, and not just in the Christian uh, milieu, but also in other religions as well, that you do have to wonder, especially for the ones that are of kind of ancient origins, where you, you can't go back and verify for yourself, you know, you, you do kind of wonder, it, <coughs> did somebody just kind of do this at some point for the sake of either creating a point of veneration or for some other purpose that wasn't so great? So, so that skepticism you know, might not have existed in your group, but I do think that skepticism also exists, even amongst faithful believers, that they wonder, you know, because the, because we've all had many experiences of people being kind of um, fooled by other people on, on issues like this. Yeah, so there there's all kinds of reactions um, that, that occur <coughs> to the modern mind that just would not have occurred at all to these people, right? If the priest said that was a vial of Christ's blood, the priest had authority, that would have been good enough and everybody would have, it, either out of a desire to be devotional or if not that, out of just fear of the consequences of not, you know, they would have decided, well, it's better to go do it, <laughs> right? And that's kind of, not, not everybody in this period of time is to be seen at all some sort of like super good, pious, ultra-religious person. Many people would have been motivated by fear. Just the, you know, the prospect, the very likely prospect in their mind that God is real and that Satan is real would have compelled many of them to do at least the minimum of what they needed to do to try to, to, to stay safe. And that's just not something that almost any of us in, I guess, in at least the modern Western world, um, uh, we don't think in those terms. Lots of us don't. Um, so, and I think that Taylor talks a lot about this, the, the, the things, because it is probably the most extreme example of the, of the enchanted mentality, the one that is that really makes you think, you know, <laughs> and which we usually would say, oh, that well, that's where they kind of got into superstition. Spirits of the <clears throat> woods. Now, it's not particularly Christian, by the way, to think of spirits of the woods. There was, there was an overlapping of older, you guys, I guess, would call pagan, you know, spiritual beliefs that people hung on to and kind of clamped together with their Christianity. 
So these sprites and spirits of the wood would not have been anything taught by the priests, but people still would believe in them. Yeah. Did you have? Oh, yeah, I was going to say, it sheds light over sort of more of a uh, sort of saintly thing, where you know, St. Francis, Francis of Sisi, where he sort of found uh, nature in like, well, found the uh, divine uh, sort of attributes in nature itself, sort of thing. And you think you think about it, it's like if you compare the works of Saint Francis Sisi to, let's say, uh, Darwin's Origin of Species, you can see sort of our new view of nature in that sort of sense, in which that nature is something that's uh, on its own and sort of it's random. And we don't really see it as anything uh, good or bad or having any divine connotations. It's just sort of is there, sort of thing. Right. Yeah. It's it's there. It's a product of if the evolutionary theory which uh, an awful lot of modern people have more or less adopted, right? Um, it, it, it's, it's really random, it's not intentional, uh, and it's not explainable, ultimately. Um, and with that comes, I mean, the notion that it, it, it's ours, right, if anything, that we can appropriate it. And this is the part of it that we don't usually think about uh, but maybe we ought to think about it a little bit is when you start thinking of nature as just something uh, without any sort of moral or spiritual meaning there is a risk that you run of instrumentalizing it to the point where you can exploit it, abuse it, etc. There's that side of it, you know, the, the modern mentality is very um, uh, exploitative for want of a better word and maybe part of the reason why is is because of that detachment from that concept yeah well, I've had, like realize like a hobby in view of the world like, yeah where there is a but uh, there is like a a, mm -hmm. a, a, a fight to to survive mm -hmm. to be better than everyone else and that that in turn makes us that well, is it something that doesn't have its own uh, autonomy, we can exploit it to that. But if you exist outside of that, then you can just live with it, not use it. Yeah, I think that's a great point. Hobbes uh, and the Hobbesian way of thinking about nature precedes Darwin by a lot, but it, it kind of paves the way in that nature becomes something for human beings to use for their survival, right? And and we, we don't normally teach this in political science, but he has a whole scientific theory as well about Nature really uh, is, is a very, very, it's just material. And the mo movements and growth in nature are a mechanical uh, process, a process of, of cause and effect that he says goes back. You know, theoretically you could call that first origin God, but it's not as though he sees everything else as imbued with any sort of special spiritual significance. Yeah. Uh, I've read an article where recently where it's talking about how humanity has sort of gone above sort of uh, the world of nature and how we've become sort of a force of it where you know we have such a dimension it's, 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 cra it's quite crazy <laughs> but when you think about it it's like oh, because we have such a detrimental effect on nature where we control it where we can control the habitats and things around us that we kind of think that in the whole sort of like I said this is a little bit of an exploitative split from it at the same time it's really uh, dangerous and quite scary in terms of humanity as it goes forward at this point where it's like we our, our world is actually now starting to become not just a product in our minds where we can change it through our own use it but it starts to become something that uh <coughs> like enhanced production we can probably change it to something else mm -hmm. well we've got i mean think about this for i mean i realize this is a controversial uh, assumption right but many people think that through our technological advancements we've created something called global warming which is has affected the the world's atmosphere to the point where you know climates are changing around the world changing where things grow what can live there and maybe even ultimately destroying the planet if that's not human beings having godlike power over you know the the world i don't know what is and then we we have genetic genetic engineering and you know, I mean there's there's many examples of that where we've moved into a position where where we are man, we we I suppose you could say we still can't create it we can't create existence itself but we can manipulate it like never before and so this you know 
<coughs> certainly um, adds to to a different way of looking at, at the world and at nature than, than folks would have had way back then. Um, okay, now Taylor says that what has largely replaced the enchanted world is the mind. Uh, does everybody follow what he meant by that? That the mind, now, because in the modern sense, it becomes predominant, right? Um, let's talk about, well, maybe the most uh, crucial example of this would be um, the mental illness example and the black bile and all that. Um, that's on page 36. He gets started with a discussion there on the top of page 36. He says, but the fuzziness is even greater than that. Even the line between ordinary cases of influence and full possession, meaning demonic possession, was not sh totally sharp. There is a gamut of cases. People spoke of possession when our higher faculties and powers seemed totally eclipsed. For instance, when people fell into a delirium. But in a sense, any evil influence involves some eclipse of the higher capacities in us. Only in the case of good influence, for instance, when we were, are filled with grace, do we become one with the agent or force through what is best and highest in us. Demons may possess us, but God or the Holy Spirit enter us or quicken us from within. So that's the old experience, right? Um, also on the next page is where he discusses bile. Uh, about two-thirds of the way down on 37, he says, consider melancholy. Black bile is not the cause of melancholy. It embodies, it is me melancholy. The emotional life is porous here. It doesn't exist, simply <coughs> exist in an inner mental space. Our vulnerability to evil, the inwardly destructive, extends to more than just spirits, which are malevolent. It goes beyond them to things which have no wills, but are nevertheless redolent with evil meanings. So if you felt that you were, uh, it had your body had been invaded by black bile, you were invaded by something evil. The cure for them that would not be to go see a psychiatrist, right? What would you do? Go see a priest. Yes, you'd go well, see a priest. <coughs> balance your humans by bloodletting. There you go. You could try to remove it, which people did. Yeah, and probably both, right? You know, hedge your pets. Um, so he says, see the contrast, a modern is feeling depressed, melancholy. He's told it's just your body chemistry. You're hungry or there is a hormone malfunction or whatever. Straight away he feels relieved. He can take a distance from this feeling, which is ipso facto declared not justified. Things don't really have this meaning. It just feels this way, which is the result of a causal action utterly unrelated to the meaning of things. This step of disengagement depends on our modern mind-body distinction and the relegation of the physical to being just a contingent cause of the psychic. Okay, so um, the, you know, what you mentioned, you know, remove, trying to, let's grab some leeches and see if we can get rid of some of this, is a little bit closer to the modern idea of medical or psychological care, right? Uh, but even there, it's a it's an evil force that's within you, right? So the cure is not going to simply be withdrawing it because it can always come back and there can always be more. Something has to be done to combat the evil, and so naturally the person is going to turn to both prayer, but also you know somebody with more efficacy, and so this is where you get, um, well, at the most extreme case, exorcisms, right? Right? Or if not exorcisms, anointings and prayers and holy water and all of those things that um, the people did. And, and one of the points he wants to make is that for them, bodily health and mental health were never treated separately from what we would call spiritual health or spiritual things. It was all tied up together. Okay, now what, having said that, what would, the, what's are some of the modern reactions to that point of view that say mental or mental health problems or however you might want to put it are really caused by evil forces what what might some modern reactions be to that 
notion. There are still people in our world, right, who do believe those things too, that people can be possessed, that, that evil spirits are real, right? But for those who don't believe those things, what kind of reactions come to mind? I guess not the best view. The best view is that that now is total feelings. The best thing I'd be like, you, you think it's like, oh, it's something in their head. They maybe need to you know, have a rest or lie down, like he says, it's something that's right. like an issue that you can simply solve to the brain chemistry. Uh -huh. But at the same time, I don't know, I think uh, there might be a, a, a different uh, set of things where it's like, you might actually tell a person it might be good for them to do something they did like that they would make them better. In that case, uh, I know a lot of religious people even now uh, back home, but uh, if they have any like sort of mental problems or something like that, they'll go look. At, they'll go to the church, sort of thing, talk to the priest about it and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So if we haven't completely detached from them, or uh, I need to get this out of me, sort of thing, it's this evil force. But even then, you'll find a lot. Of, like, I mean, I think you could be arguing some majority of people who think in terms of have more faith in psychotherapy than. Uh, then the uh, help of the church, even then the help of the church arguably is some sort of psychotherapy in some sense. Yeah, and I think that people are often more consciously aware of that. In other words, if they go, they're going to go with maybe the full notion that it is therapeutic, right? That um, that's part of the process rather than I'm going to go and by touching this or by being blessed by this person, I'll be healed. It's more you know, an interaction there, along with others. I know you're right, many people do that, and I think many people do both. In other words, the strategy a lot of times is I'll go to whatever, you know, spiritual source I have, if I have one, but I'll also go to the doctor and I'll go to the psychotherapist, okay? So I'm not going to solely rely upon this, and, and we in, in doing that, we kind of acknowledge that there's in our minds, there's these different parts of ourselves, and they're not all perfectly connected, right? Um, and that may be more accurate. It certainly wasn't the way these folks thought, though. You know, for them, it was all connected. And so it's just very hard for us to, um, to imagine it, and I think this is why it's so important to, to dwell on it. Now, he does say that we're nostalgic for it, okay? He says that many people cannot, you know, they really have some notion, maybe it's based on reading fiction and books or watching movies or playing video games, because a lot of video games go back to the medieval times, right? Uh, I mean, music, whatever it may be, there's a lot of that in our culture, right? Um, what is it that I watched lately? I went through a spate of watching a show, which is really kind of juvenile, but it's Rain, and it's about Queen Mary. It's a little bit, you know, it's a little bit soap opery, but it's, <coughs> but what they depict, you know, is people full-throated, you know, like corruption, but at the same time believing they better go pray before the host, or, you know, there's these evil forces out in the woods and something needs to be done about them. Um, we have TV shows like that, movies that we watch all the time. We share some more of a product talk about our romanticism as well, where it's sort of like, uh, where you look back in the old days, it's like, oh, it's all great, and you can go, you can go, every force, uh, every sort of wishes they can go back to that sort of time. But even then, uh, a lot of our culture now, which is, uh, as Linda Bottom uh, often says, a lot of our culture now is uh, cultural romanticism. It's all sort of based around this view of uh, an overall destiny or other purposes to all find the one and stuff like that. Um, and uh, and of course that's uh, quite similarly to back how it was in the old days, which is which is quite funny in a way. Seeing that you sort of you come out with mind to them, and you think you might have a you might go back to sort of the classical view of society, like an Aristotle and Plato, but instead we sort of come back into a romantic idea of, uh, of everything uh, having a purpose, everything being absolutely uh, in a sense uh, wonderful, but also at the same time linked between our own set of world view and stuff. Uh, having everything being spiritual still. So we've got a pretty uh, romantic sort of culture now, we've got a mix of sort of uh, everything being a product of the mind, but at the same time, if there's an overall sort of destiny or the universe is going to make things better. Sort of yeah, thing. that's interesting. It's still there. Um, I mean, is one of the things you're thinking of this notion that there's this one 
like soul made out there in the world that will complete a person yeah, and that kind of stuff. I don't think the Bible talks a lot about that way. Right. <laughs> it criticizes yeah. the whole idea, especially because, uh, just like I said beforehand, where these days we haven't really swapped uh, the divine purpose at all. Because these days we sort of just call it the universe, mm-hmm. a set up to this or destiny, this fate. That's it, in the end, that's the, again, it's, still, it's quite funny how that comes, that comes yeah. together from the world we have coming from the mind, uh, from the buff itself, because it's like, uh, it's sort of a mix. You've got, you've got, yeah, you've that's got, true. You've got to look at, at the world through uh, things, and uh, we, go, we go through phases, arguably, but it's like everything's uh, to do with the mind. But as soon as we find who we think is the one, bam, <laughs> this is the universe. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> whatever that means, whatever. The, seems like it makes makes less sense in a way, but it's a reassertion of maybe maybe we just can't find any other reason. Do we need a reason for getting up in the morning? And, like and still, you know, have and it, and is there a point of you know, does life have to be interesting? I don't know. What what is anybody has anybody else encountered this the romanticism that he's talking about and no know what he's talking about. I mean, I don't know if this is a, that it's kind of weird, there's a convergence here, which is another one of those things that happens to people now. Um, but last night we were talking about, in my book club, Wendell Berry's chapter seven, which is about, among other things, the mind-body distinction and, the, and human relationships. And he goes through these lists of very romantic notions that he wants to bust through because they ruin people's lives. And one of them is, you know, there's this one person out here who's going to complete you absolutely. And if you find that one person, all your problems will be solved. And if you ever look at another person, there's something terribly wrong with you because if you really love them, no one else would ever seem attractive. And all of these things are, they really are incredible, you know, when you really think about just incredibly idealistic and magical and juvenile or, uh, I want to say, immature and many, and I'm not just, I'm not saying that because of age range, I'm saying like people of all age ranges often hold these very like weird magical views about human relationships, but they don't necessarily relate them back to God. They don't say, you know, God, uh, some of them do, but I mean, a lot of them don't say, God has a plan for me. I've got to find that one person that God chose for me. But somehow there's still that one person. It's just. It's funny because it goes even <laughs> further where it's like, uh, you expect your partner to know everything about you, everything you're going to say, what you're feeling. So right, yeah. You, you, tell, you tell them to go away, but in fact, you actually want them to, you know, come come. Uh-huh. <laughs> it's, it's quite funny, it's ridiculous. Like, like you're supposed to have some sort of telepathic yeah, connection right. with them, right? I mean, that's all very magical, too. It sounds like you watch The School of Life. I highly <laughs> recommend it for that reason, because it, it really, I mean, it's like, a, it's on YouTube if you're not familiar with it, but it's like school to make grown-ups out of people who think this way, among other things, that there's a lot of other features to this, but they dwell upon how the way that we think about the world is oftentimes so unrealistic that um, it, it, disal- it disallows any sort of real happiness, you know. So anyway, I, I, I think that's interesting because it's almost like through that you still see people trying to replicate in a more secular way this, uh, this enchantment. And I, I mean, I don't know about your re- I'd like to hear your reaction. My reaction is the, the maybe people would be so bored if they didn't do that, that they wouldn't be able to get out of bed in the morning. I don't know. I mean, what are, does anybody else have a reaction to why people think this way? And I fully realize that some of you may think this way, and I'm not trying to be uh, <laughs> insulting anybody. But, so, but it's all around us, right? Anybody want to us want to hazard a guess? I think. Let's see what time is it? We've got three minutes. What other kind of romances did this um, the author of the book that your book club is reading mention? Wendell Berry, The Unsettling of America, and it's a set piece chapter that doesn't necessarily relate as much to agriculture, although he does relate it to, you know, how we objectify the land. But he spends a lot of time on on how we objectify bodies and how we expect perfection out of bodies and about and relationships uh, and how that kind of ties back in with the whole 
you know, we're autonomous beings that have total control over our lives. So therefore, we should all look like gods, and we should all have mates that are perfect and wonderful. Life should be absolutely supreme. Otherwise, how can we say that we're actually in control like we think we are? <laughs> so he, it's a good chapter. It really makes you think. Um, and the part I like about it the most is he tries to bust through this notion of exclusivity. He, t he talks about fidelity being an absolute serious uh, commitment that you make in full knowledge that every day of your life you're going to be attracted to other people. Nobody wants to say that. But fidelity takes on a whole new and much deeper, meaningful existence if you actually figure that out. But if you don't figure it out, Wendell Berry says basically you're heading for a divorce because no one can do that. No one can do that. And I like that. I think that's, uh, that's so true. It's very honest. <laughs> it's, very, it's extremely honest. And, and it's part of growing up, I think, to, to understand and acknowledge and accept what's going on inside yourself rather than combating. And if you know who you are, then you can, then you can fix your life according to the way you want to. And I, that's, so I'd recommend that chapter for anybody. But, um, you know, because I've seen people go through just, like, they have this incredible fairy tale wedding. That's the, that's the symbol of our romantic culture, right? Is, you know, the fairy tale wedding that costs thirty or forty thousand dollars, and you go to, you know, you get your pictures taken on the beach, the beautiful couture, you know, wedding dress, and then three years later, you're divorced. Think about it, you know. I mean, I don't know what all this has to do with Charles Taylor, but it's all very, it's all very weird when you really think about it. As though those kinds of actions and spending all that money and wearing that beautiful dress can make your union last and be meaningful. Otherwise, what's it about?